you are about to enter into a new world of knowledge, curiosities, and high strangeness. This is a podcast of Straight Up Strange Productions. This episode is brought to you by our Patreon supporters. Become a patron today at patreon.com forward slash into the portal. Hello, and welcome back into the portal. I'm Amber Ray. And I'm Andrew McKay. And we're back with our summer vault series. Hmm? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and holy moly, does it feel like it's been a long ass time since we've been on the mic. It does feel like it's been a long time. <laughs> at the same time, though, I'm going to say that this month has flown. I can't believe it's oh, the 25th today. Seriously. It's your birthday um, tomorrow. It is my birthday. That's tomorrow. crazy. Woohoo. Um, yeah, I know. It's crazy. Like we, we, it's so funny. We were so crazy busy with work and everything. We didn't even introduce the series last week when we decided that we were going to dig into our Patreon archives for you guys and, and re-release some old goodies. Yeah. So basically what we have for you, starting with the last release with the Orang Pen deck, is uh, a summer series, a summer vault series. Yeah. And we're super excited about it because... We didn't really know what we were going to do with a lot of our um, Patreon episodes, the early ones that we released, and they were kind of just sitting there, and our patrons had enjoyed them, and um, we thought you guys might too. So, yeah, pretty Mm -hmm. stoked on it. Yeah. Not to mention, it's given us some more time to work on our September episodes. Yeah. Yay. And that's another thing, that's another reason we wanted to do this little bit before we get into Lord Lucan, is um, just to let you guys know that we are not slowing down. It's been a bit of a slow summer for ITP because of work and life. But we really appreciate your support and uh, you guys continuing to listen to the show. And we have, yeah, lots of big things coming. We have like, I think, five episodes in the works right now that are being worked on. Research is uh, happening and they're all really cool. So, yeah, yep. lots of stuff to come. Mm-hmm. Lots coming down the pipe. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what we're going to get into in this uh, mm-hmm. archive episode. This was a really fun one because it was really different for us, like going into like more of a true crime kind of an episode slash like mystery, you know? Yeah, definitely. Uh, definitely a who done it for sure. In a way. I mean, yeah, for, for us it was. For the rest of the media world, it was pretty much a, closed, a one and done. Closed. <laughs> Close case, yeah. Uh, yeah, in a lot of ways. But there's mm-hmm. a lot of loose ends that weren't talked about that obviously we get into in this episode, yeah. which are pretty fascinating ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's some pretty colorful characters. and Oh, uh, God, yeah. And just very confusing stories That's <laughs> from for sure. some people. Yeah. So it's, it's a really fascinating case, and it really hasn't gotten the attention it deserves, I think. So I'm glad we decided to cover this and we did it, you know, Patreon exclusive. And now you guys are all going to get to hear a little bit about this. It was a, a fun little mini so A right? classic, a classic mini so a tale of mystery and deception. Mm-hmm. And probably the most, I mean, yeah, definitely one of its kind uh, for Into the Portal. So, I mean, this guy was uh, infamous <laughs> for very, sure. Very, very. Well, without further we, ado. Yeah, without further ado, indeed. Let's, let's get into it. <laughs> the Legend of Lord Lucan is a dark, mysterious tale. It begins with lavish opulences of wealth and antiquated titles of aristocracy. The young lord grew up in an era plagued by World War II, from which he emerged unscathed as a boy, sent away to relatives in North America for safety. It was from these sheltered origins that the enigmatic, notorious playboy would emerge, showered in excesses and prone to indulgences beyond his means. Indeed, a classic tale of mystery and deception, and perhaps the perfect setup. Join us on Into the Portal for an all-too-real modern tale of suspense that has lasted more than 45 years, as we discuss one of the most notorious vanished persons in history, the mystery of Lord Lucan. Welcome back into the portal. I'm Amber Ray. 
And I'm Andrew McKay. And we're back with a brand new Patreon mini so Yeah, what's up, everybody? November. We and we got some newbies this month. For we so, do. So, uh, yeah, welcome into uh, the Patreon community. We are yes. so stoked to have you here, and uh, we're looking forward to bringing you guys just amazing content into mm-hmm. Patreon over the next little while. So, Lots starting of fun with stuff. This. Yep. So, today we're actually getting into a little bit of a different um, tale. It is a mystery, one of a little bit more of a human nature. Yeah. So, we're actually going to get into a bit of a whodunit mystery murder. Murder mystery. <laughs> I got that mixed up. Yeah, right. <laughs> mystery. <laughs> mystery murder. I don't know. <laughs> mystery murder. That sounds like a... I don't even know. That's funny, though. Anyway, yeah. So, who, who are we talking about today, Amber? We're talking about none other than the dubious Lord Lucan. That's right. Mm-hmm. So, uh, some of you might have heard of, may have heard of this guy, um, but uh, I, I definitely hadn't until, uh, you know, it sort of came up in one of our... One of our one of the strange books that we have in our yeah. library here with one mysteries of the many. and things. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we're gonna give his uh, this really it's, so, a, it's a good story. It's a whodunit murder, but it's also he has become the most notorious missing person ever. Pretty much, like, yeah. yeah. Which is in, in modern times. In modern times. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so here we go. The Legend of Lord <laughs> Lucan. Yeah, so it's it's murky muddled. Um, there's uh, the background can be vague in certain parts, but uh, essentially he was a, he came from wealthy aristocracy, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so Richard John Bingham, he was the seventh Earl of Lucan, most commonly known as Lord Lucan, like we said. So he was a part of the Anglo-Irish aristocracy, and he was the eldest son of uh, George Charles Patrick Bingham, who was the, of course the sixth Earl of Lucan. <laughs> um, yeah, he, so, and this guy, he was a, an Irish peer, a British soldier, and a very gritty labor politician. His father. Mm-hmm. So his his early life was you know pretty straightforward for what you would expect from a. A gentleman in this type of position in life. He was born on the 18th uh, of December 1934, and he was raised in Mary Le Bon, London. And uh, yeah, he was raised in a relatively healthy manner, like super privileged, obviously. We don't really know, obviously, the relationship was what it was like between him and his father. I'm picturing like lots of polo mattresses, lots of. Uh... But opulent you, fabric. But of course, we, we, we know all too well from fiction and reality that uh, those types of uh, households don't always uh, bring up the happiest no, people. No, not the most functional. Anyway, in 1939, him and his sister Jane were evacuated to Wales because of the uh, dangers of the Second World War were becoming a little bit precarious in London. And the following year, they were joined by their three other, or sorry, two other siblings, Sally and Hugh. And at this point, there's a little bit of a Canadian connection because the Lucan children were moved to Toronto uh, <laughs> to escape the war as well. And then later on to New York, where they actually had family friends. They ended up spending five years with a family acquaintance of the Lucans uh, in there. It was their godmother. It was Lord Lucan's godmother specifically. Um, do we have a name for her here? I can't remember. I think it comes up in a second. But anyway, they're in the United States and young Lord Lucan... Lucky guy, stuffing at the Harvey Preparatory School just outside New York, one of the most prestigious in the country. And he was spending most of his summers kind of chilling in the Adirondack Mountains, summer camps. Well, pretty definitely cake, sounds cake. like he was living it up. Yeah. And even though we're in a state of war, it uh, doesn't sound like he was too aware of it. <laughs> no, not at this time. Of course, the war ends, and he would later on return to Europe and follow uh, in his father's footsteps, whether he wanted to or not, is we don't really know. But he joined the Coldstream Guards, which is the oldest uh, regiment in the British Army. Okay, wait. So he was born in 1934, so he would have been 10 years old in uh, 1944. So he would have been way too young to actually participate in yeah. the war itself. Yeah. But sorry, he, he ended up joining in anyway? Yeah, no, He so this is goal, after the, the war. So he would have been a teenager, I suppose, at this point, right? And he uh, served time in West Germany from 1953 to 55. Oh, his two okay. years of uh, service, I guess. Hmm. I, don't, I don't know if it was mandatory. It must have been mandatory. I wonder. Right? Hmm. Anyway, he was discharged and would end up uh, joining a merchant bank, something that was a typical uh, occupation for people in aristocracy. <laughs> and uh, relatively modest salary, though, 500 pounds a year. But, of course, this which is only about 10 grand, like, not a lot. But, of course, you have commissions and different things like that. Plus, he was a Family trust fund money. kid. So mm-hmm. um, lots of cash for the Lucans, for sure. Yeah, very, like I said here, various family trusts and things like that. So, at this point... We've got uh, the the picture of Lord Lucan, his background, his upbringing, and uh, this is where things start to kind of shift. I feel like you kind of teed him up to be like this, like super, like richy rich 
kind of character where he's just living in his fantasy rich world and he, doesn't really have to participate in society too too much like you right. know like he does his his penance um time like, you know <laughs> serving in like a very obviously he's in west what was it west berlin or west germany doesn't actually say. Oh, no, it says West Germany, so he would have been relatively safe. If you're in West yeah. Berlin, then you're a little bit more of a sticky situation Ooh. because you're right behind the wall. Yeah, you wouldn't. There but, wouldn't be any Western. Yeah. On, in, on the east side? Of course, yeah, because Berlin was actually in the Soviet territory. So there was, like, the Berlin Wall. Right. Um, but there was... Oh, yeah, so the Berlin Wall separated the city, but the actual... Berlin was in Germany. Oh, I East see what Germany. you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. So yeah, yeah. they had to... Right. Yeah, so yeah. it was kind of a sticky situation. Right. But he wasn't in that. He was very safe, very cushy, is all I'm trying to say. Right. Like, this guy just... For all of you listening in, like, he's just, yeah, like, a, a little poofy pants, is what I'm imagining. And by all accounts... He, into his adult years, into his later life, he always liked to indulge, right? And he was very much about himself, not mm-hmm. really about anyone else. And we'll see that right now. Because, like you said, things are going to get interesting. Um, so, essentially, yeah, Richard, soon to be the seventh earl, so he hadn't actually inherited that title yet. Right. But he was, like I said, very prone to enjoying his position in life and just uh, had a lot of hobbies, a lot of expensive things. Mm -hmm. And one of those expensive things was his wife. (laughs) (laughs) So Veronica Duncan, um, they met in early 1963 and they they were engaged shortly after. They basically got married and it was the same year they met, they got married. That's a quick turnaround. Yeah, yeah. So very, very quick turnaround. She obviously saw what she... She saw the wealth. That was probably all she saw. Like, I'm not, I don't really know too much about her other than the fact that she gets really effing weird in her She's weird later right lives. from Jump Street, too. Well, I guess. Yeah, you have, like, to, you have to wonder what her motives are, right? Right. Mm-hmm. So, essentially, um, this was, like, basically at the same time his dad died. So, he inherits this title. He inherits all this wealth, all these um, different, like, yeah, titles and fortunes and everything else. Mm-hmm. Um, it was about... Okay, in today's terms, it would have been about $7 million he inherited. In cash. In cash. And then he also has estates and trusts. So he has a lot to play with. Yeah. And so this is where we kind of get into another sort of angle of Lord Lucan. Because he was a notorious gambler. And he spent a lot of time at this one particular club called the Claremont Club. Yeah. Which was essentially where anyone who was anyone was there to gamble. And he met a lot of people, including the people... Oh, what's his name? The guy that wrote um, 007. Oh, my God. Uh, Peter uh, Fleming. Ian Fleming. Fleming. He met Ian Fleming there, who also liked to frequent that same location. That's right. And same with... Um, Peter Sellers. Peter Sellers. That was the other guy. Yeah, I was trying so, to think of. of course, Pink Panther. So, essentially, yeah. He gets into this sort of culture of gambling quite extensively. Um, gets the name Lucky Luke Khan. That's how uh, much of a regular he was That's there. That's right, yeah. And he mostly focused on backgammon and bridge, which does take skill. It's not like he's just, like, throwing dice like craps and, you yeah. know, whatever. Interestingly, this Claremont Club was pretty close to another building that we've covered in London. Oh, goodness. Yeah, it was actually originally located at 44 Berkeley Square. Just down the way from... Just, uh, yeah. What was the number again? 50. 50, 50, 50 right? Oh, Berkeley. so that's... That's so close. That's so really, crazy, right? Really close. So I haven't actually like Google mapped it to see how close, right. but I'm imagining it's like, yeah, just a couple blocks. And just maybe. to kind of a, uh, like an idea of this Claremont Club. So yeah, it's in a, essentially a mansion. It's not mm-hmm. like a. It's like a big opulent building. Yeah, but it's, it's like a house that's been it's retrofitted a to a club, right? So mm-hmm. it's got, you've got like the bar on the second floor and like the games uh, on the massive downstairs. And of course you've got these you know, vaulted ceilings with all the crown moldings and everything, and you can just imagine, right? Well, just even, if you think about it, right, like, the opulence that went into old world style of houses in London and stuff, like, you know, around that time, it would have been exactly that. It wouldn't be anything, like, we would imagine today, like, a a modern home. Or, like, a casino is, like, what I'm thinking, right? I'm thinking, like, the gambling club. What I'm picturing in my head is just, like, the quintessential, like, high-end, yeah, like, clubs that you see in, like, a James Bond movie. Absolutely. It's not like there's, like, yeah, like, it's not like Vegas. But anyways, yeah, so he was a member of this club. He was there basically every day, like I said. And interestingly, this club was still in existence up until this year. It actually yeah. closed 2018, March. Yeah. Crazy, right? Yeah. And so anyways, we've got this funny dynamic, right? Because um, Lord Lucan has just inherited a ton of money 
wealth, titles, all of that. He has a nice new bit of arm candy in mm. Veronica. Mm -hmm. But he's also straying away from her because he's got this gambling addiction. Yeah. It is a full-on addiction. You can't tell me it's not. You're, he's literally there, like, every chance he gets, every day, every night. And so, obviously, Veronica starts to get a little bit peeved about this. Mm. Initially, she tried to you know, join them and try to get some skills. She wanted to play backgammon and bridge, but she didn't enjoy them to the same extent as Lucan. And mm -hmm. so she ended up just getting a little bit. Mm. And then of course he's got his other, he's got golf, he's got hunting, he's got all these other whatever, like expensive interests, buying yachts and all this stuff. And <laughs> she's just kind of left in the dust. Hmm. Um, but they do start to pop out a couple of kids too at this point. I believe there was two total um okay. but essentially yeah he he's uh making all these connections um Ian Fleming like we said he actually had a uh interview to or not an interview what would you call it like a screening a cast, he was gonna like a, cast. a casting call yeah he was gonna maybe potentially play James Bond in the first ever James Bond but yeah. it just didn't happen for him he had, he had the the looks and the the vibe but mm -hmm. it just didn't uh didn't quite work out the looks though he's kind of a weirdo <laughs> that's what people at the time said about him anyway I mean I don't know I <laughs> I wouldn't know but uh <laughs> 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 yeah he huh. didn't uh, didn't get the part I think he was pretty sour about that um, there's a photo of him doing the classic, like, spin around from the intro of the James Bond when he shoots through the, you know, the, right. the, the portal and then the clothes, it, it get, and then the blood comes down and all that. <laughs> it's kind of a funny photo. Um, yeah. we can put that up on our website for you guys. But, um, yeah, so I, I don't even know, like, do you, do you think that this ha has anything to do with how things kind of play out? Just, just like things that have happened so far. Do you think that he's, you think he's unstable at this point? <laughs> clearly. I think he is. Well, you think he's got a full-blown gambling addiction. Because that's the thing. Like, he... Yeah. I mean, I guess when you're hanging around with characters like Peter Sellers, you can't exactly be in the best state of mind. No. I suppose. Uh, yeah. You're... Yeah, like, exactly. We teed it all up, right? Like, he's got this very rich, opulent background. Kind of just a richy, rich character. Goes about <laughs> his life just in a fantasy world, essentially. Like, you know, it's just this... The, the whirlwind sort of... Um, lifestyle of the rich right and famous and he was definitely increasingly um notorious especially in that local scene but beyond as well so now we're kind of getting to the crux of the mystery here yeah do you want to you want to give this part <clears throat> well this is uh, yeah okay all right so on november 7th 1974 nanny sandra eleanor rivet of the Lucan household. Mm -hmm. At this time, Lord Lucan was actually separated from Veronica, living in a private residence, um, and then she had custody of the two kids. Yes. So, essentially, the one night here, November 7th, um, Sandra Eleanor Rivet was still in the household when normally she would have had the night off. Um, supposedly, she had a boyfriend, and he wasn't able to meet her that evening, so they rearranged to meet the next. So, she switched her night off, and it was very fatal error. Indeed. Essentially, um, yeah, so she put the kids to bed and descended down towards the kitchen and was bludgeoned over the head as she entered the kitchen door. Right. And um, essentially how, okay, this is where it starts to get really muddled because it, it's a he said, she said situation. So essentially, Sandra's dead. She got bludgeoned over the head. And, um, and then we get Lady Lucan supposedly entering and seeing well actually no like she she came down she noticed that sandra because sandra was the premise of her going down to the kitchen was to get some tea for lady lucan yes. and when she didn't arrive like you know like 10 15 minutes pass um she goes down um to the kitchen herself and allegedly the attacker was waiting for her and he came up from behind, so she goes through the door, and he grabs her from behind, and there's this vicious struggle that ensues. Right. And essentially, uh, at one point, Lady Lucan stated that her attacker told her to shut up, and she says later on that she did recognize the voice as that of her husband, Lord Lucan. Okay, so... But, okay. So I essentially what happens is the struggle ensues, um, then this is where things start to get weird, so apparently, this is a direct quote from, <laughs> this is just from Wikipedia, just a quick yeah. reference. Yeah. But it says here that the two apparently, this quote, the two apparently continued to fight. She bit his fingers, and when he threw her face down to the carpet, 
She managed to turn around and squeeze his testicles, causing him to release the grip on her throat and give up the fight. When she asked where Rivet was, the nanny, Lucan was at first evasive. So at this point, he's given up the fight and they are separated. They're no longer struggling. So therefore, I'm imagining her looking at him, imagining a light on, like, you know, it is night, but I'm imagining there's some sort of light so she can see who it is. Hmm. Anyways, essentially, Kay says here he was at first evasive, but eventually admitted to having killed her. Terrified, this is continuing the quote, yeah. Lady Lucan told him she could help him escape if only he would remain at the house for a few days, allowing her injuries to heal. Lucan walked upstairs and sent his daughter to bed, then went into the one of the bedrooms. When Veronica entered to lie on the bed, he told her to put towels down first to avoid staining the bedding. So he's obviously not in like a manic craze. He's not viciously trying to kill his wife at this point. Um, and then essentially when he he goes to get her some barbiturates because she's in pain or something and goes into the bathroom to get a towel and the barbiturates. And then that's when she runs, makes her escape, runs to this nearby public house, like a, a bar called the Plumber's Arms. And that's where she screams out, oh my God, I've been, I, my husband's trying to kill me and blah, blah, blah. He killed the maid. Okay. So let's just lay this out. Like, yeah. And I <clears throat> kind of want to just take a second to say what I just read might not be accurate. Because That's this one is not, This is not from the actual case file. This yeah. is just common, common public domain information. Yeah. Yeah. But this is a very confusing turn that of events. It doesn't add up for me. It doesn't, right? Because at first you get a struggle where she doesn't know who the attacker is. And then you get a conversation ensuing right after that. So you would automatically assume that she has confirmed the identity of her attacker. Yeah. And then why... There were several other opportunities, you would imagine, him going up stairs. So he essentially goes up the stairs. I missed that part in the quote. But he goes upstairs, puts the daughter to bed, apparently, and then she follows him upstairs. Why wouldn't she run out at that point and go run to the plumber's arms and, and tell people that? Well, that's then? one thing. Yeah, totally. And just why... Okay, if if this is if this is Lord Lucan and he's hiding, he accidentally kills the maid thinking that it's his wife he's bludgeoned her with a blunt with an object that mm -hmm. we later find out to be a, a tire or iron or a pipe or yeah lead pipe or a classic it was, yeah. it was scarlet in the kitchen with the pipe um <laughs> and uh why why all of a sudden is it so difficult to subdue yet another like not to be sexist but obviously it's his wife much smaller more frail than him mm -hmm. he's a big guy he was like mm -hmm. six foot three like you know not like a pushover and he's got a lead pipe he just bludgeoned the maid. How is he all of a sudden struggling so badly with mm -hmm. his with wife? With you. It should have been yeah, very yeah, easy to just bludgeon you over the head and kill you. And why would he just stop? Oh, you squeezed his nuts and then he stops and realizes, oh, maybe I need help you to help covering it up? Yeah. That is very bizarre. It doesn't add up. It doesn't add up at all. Her whole story falls apart for me right away. But supposedly she is taken um, at her word. Right. So yeah, like we said, like first she goes from not knowing who her attacker is and saying that she's only able to confirm via the voice recognition from her telling, from him telling her to shut up. And then it goes on to a full on encounter with her ex-husband where he gives up his attack to aid her with her injuries right. <clears throat> only for her to run out when it's convenient. And I put a huge air quotes there because it's just like mm -hmm. she had much better opportunities to escape. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, why would you wait for him to go upstairs, put the daughter to bed, come and address you again, get you barbiturates, get you your towel to wipe off the blood off your face? Like, all this does not make sense to me. No. Why would you even go upstairs with him in the, in the first place? Wouldn't you think, like, automatically, oh, well, he's just going to finish off the job, you know? So, again, like, we're, we didn't really allude to the extent of their hatred for one another before this happened. Right. It was a pretty bitter separation, obviously, Very with, bitter. The, with the custody of the children, like like most often are. And Lots she was blaming are. his, like, you know, his gambling addictions, probably drinking, too, I would imagine. Who yeah. knows what else is going on? Just the party life, right? Right. Doesn't want anything to do with it and is using that against him so she gets custody of the kids. Yeah. And so essentially the whole premise of this night is he's been living away from them at a separate location, but he's been attempting to contact them and be a part of their lives. And right three days before this night actually occurred, there was an instance where he sent them a kitten as like some sort of like gift. And um, essentially the kitten was returned to him um, throat slit on his doorstep. By Veronica. Yeah, so she's batshit crazy. Yeah, so let's just start with that and just 
so everyone is aware that this is the type of person that he is dealing with. Very vengeful. Yeah, yeah I, like even like here, there's two options for this. Like how I'm leaning with this story. Like mm-hmm. and I'll give it at the end too. But it's like I'm either 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 he was set up or he was justified <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> in him wanting to murder his wife. Mm-hmm. If you see the there's this one very bizarre wedding photo um, from their from their wedding day, like right after the ceremony. And it could just be like a coincidence, a random one-off snapshot where her, the expression on her face just happens to be <laughs> really bizarre. <laughs> but it's basically like this stone cold, bleak, soulless expression. Like as if what she just did was for a greater purpose in the future or that she just like, she, Oof, she's just like a side succubus. Way soul. Yeah. Yeah. It's oh, that's a, interesting. It's, it's a dark photo. It's weird. So apologies to everyone because I forgot to premise this whole story of the murder and the night with that slaying of the kitten because I think that definitely um, sets up the characters. So you can, yeah, Lord Lucan, maybe not the best. He's not a peach, right, by any means. He's got no. his issues. And then she has clearly got some other issues there too. So yeah. and, and we get an in, we get a little taster of the uh, what he was like after this instance. Obviously, like you put down here from one of the friends at the Claremont Club, mm-hmm. right, George Weiss. Yeah. So he opened up just recently about Lucan's sort of demeanor and behavior the night that he was playing uh, backgammon with him at the Claremont Club, sort of right before this all went down. Mm-hmm. He basically described how Lucan appeared to be a little bit more taken aback reserve that evening, like in deep thought. Yeah, very Um, quiet. He had been contemplating something, obviously, Mm -hmm. which doesn't really lend his innocence by any means. No. But it doesn't necessarily mean he was the one in the house. Mm -hmm. Could have been a hired hired killer, could have been set up to make it look like it was him. Because if this is Veronica... The the wife could have hired someone to set it up to make it look like it was him. What better way... To get back at the husband you hate mm-hmm. than to frame him for murder. Yeah. You right? can't come back from that. No. That is basically the, the that's the, that's the cherry on top of it. That's the, it doesn't get better than <laughs> that's that. That's the ultimate F you. <laughs> Pretty much. Right? <laughs> Knowing that they're just going to rot in jail. Yeah. I don't even know. Like, anyway. So. so. Okay. So it even gets, it gets juicier, right? It does. Because now we have the aftermath. So she's run into the plumber's arms, declared, she's still covered in blood. Right. Declared that her husband's trying to kill her and that he's left, killed the maid. And left her children with this what? savage, like, their that's husband the that's just part. on a massacre rampage. You don't even, you're not even concerned about that. Like That to me, again, speaks to great um, parenting lady. evidence of a setup. Yeah, I'd yeah. say. Yeah. Anyway. Not a very good setup either. <laughs> well, I mean, it, But well, it was good enough to actually get him framed and get him charged with murder because she actually, if you want to believe it's her setting him up, she goes as far as to plant the murder weapon in the trunk of his car, the same car that's found on the side of the road, like hours after he is initially vanished. Yeah. So basically what happens after this is he is allegedly there was family friends that claimed that he showed up at the house, at their house, like the same night as this, right? He's, he's distraught, whatever. And he tells them, according to their story, that he showed up at the house, that he witnessed, uh, like a... An altercation an happening altercation, inside. And, and he was he, outside the house. Right. And that he was fairly... He thought he was being framed. He was fairly certain that Veronica was trying to set him up. So he hightails it out of there and he mm-hmm. goes. And whether he's doing this to try to have an alibi or whether he's doing this because he's genuinely needing to talk to somebody about what he just saw. Yeah. He goes to the neighbor's house to do this. Then shortly after this... Vanishes. vanishes. Mm-hmm. They find his car. I can't remember exactly where they find it's it. It's a few miles away. Like it's on a roadside somewhere. And, um, yeah. And of course, what do they find in the trunk? The, the murder weapon. weapon. Mm-hmm. That's a little odd. Like, sure, yeah. sure, if you actually genuinely did it and you're trying to run away, you might be thinking, well, I'm already basically caught. I'm on the run. What's the difference if they find the murder weapon in the trunk? But don't you think just just in case you would convenient. ditch that murder weapon? Yeah. That's like the classic murder she wrote thing where it's like, well, we found the gun in the back seat of your car parked in the <laughs> parked in the parking lot of the police station. It had your name written on the handle and it said I did it yesterday. <laughs> oh, well, it must have been then. Like, you know, like it just seems way too convenient. It's way too convenient, yeah. which again, yeah, it makes me think that is it that far of a reach for you to go from... Okay, this, what are the signs of a psychopath? Killing of innocent animals? 
Yes, so that's definitely. one marker. Yeah. Um, I feel like it's not a far reach to go from slaying an innocent kitten, literally slitting its throat and putting it on your ex-husband's doorstep to murdering a maid. I honestly, I don't want to say like, but I think there might have been some class, um, is- like not issues, but class conceptions involved in this where she wouldn't, like Lady Lucan wouldn't have placed um the value of life on the maid as much as her own. You right. know what I mean? Like where it would have been, look, she would have looked down on people like that I potentially. Wonder. I wonder. I'm not going to say that. That's me conjecturing here, but I feel like it's definitely not a far leap. No. <laughs> right. I'm just going to say that because in my mind, I really like this thought that we have this like 007 James Bond like character that's literally been in hiding for the last like 50 years we don't know if he's dead or alive he's technically never... he could still be alive he would be in his 80s yeah um and he he's which never is been totally found. reasonable there's been sightings of him all over the world yep so we're gonna we're gonna get into that in just a second here um mm-hmm. oh man i had a thought there it'll come back to me in a minute but uh okay well, well let's let's just get into this part so yeah uh he is he still out there the mystery the mystery of lady lucan and her connection to whether or not she knows actually where he may have ended up hmm. like it, it you gets think more, she would be aware or do you think the kids well might be this aware? is the thing it just gets more and more well, bizarre. she basically disowned her kids she, right? she that's another interesting part about this mm-hmm. yeah she disowned them after this yeah happened, never talked completely about disowned them she cut them out of the will Mm. Um, she basically squirreled away all the money. I think she ended up donating a whole, like the majority of her really? portion of the wealth or whatever. Hmm. Ve- that's a, that's a strange relationship it's all with so your kids, strange. right? She's um, a very strange bird. Yeah, some people remain convinced after this happened in the early seventies that Veronica must have had some sort of an idea of where he could have gone. It, 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 like, right? If you're believing this one version of the story, would she did it send left. like assassins after him then, or something? I don't know, right? I mean, she's clearly unstable. If you're, if, <laughs> like, if we're going down that road, right? So, uh, let, let me just say here. Um, oh goodness, yeah. So this, this, so once again with the haunted eyes, there was a interview done with her, and she's basically staring at the camera with literally like this is I can't remember exactly where this is from but literally the quote was like eyes that seemed haunted with the knowledge of something clearly Mm -hmm. either Mm -hmm. haunted with the fact that she had attempted to frame her husband for murder or still haunted by the fact that her husband almost killed her yeah um either way clearly something and obviously the haunted if it's the first scenario that she killed a person (laughs) right he had been twice uh declared legally dead yeah. Um, but the police have now revealed that they believe uh, that he's actually, st- there's there's a chance that he's still alive, that he's been reportedly spotted literally hundreds of times, like you just said, okay? And the only reason he was ever declared dead in the first place was because of um, inheritance factors and the passing on of his title as yes. Lord Lucan. Yes, yes. Yeah. That was the only reason why he's declared dead. That's there's it. There's no other reason to support the fact that he would have either killed himself because that's one possibility, right? That he he tried to murder his wife, ends up killing the maid, and makes a big mess of everything, and ends up murdering himself, killing yeah, himself, killing. <laughs> murdering, <laughs> self murder, murder. <laughs> still a form of murder. <laughs> yeah. um, so that that to me does not fit his his no. personality, his no any any of it. But people do suggest that too. But there was no evidence of a body ever found. There was none of that. No. And, yeah. Yeah. Reported, yeah, so he's been reported to be seen everywhere from the, Z- the U.S. to Zimbabwe. And New Zealand, that was funny, right? Um, the, in 1974, he was reported to be living in a model Land Rover with his pet Snowy the Cat, Camilla the Goat, and Redfern the Possum. Yeah, so there's lots of, obviously, rumors abound about, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, the most likely one, though, I feel like, is this, um, that there's some who believe that Lord Lucan actually made his way to Africa, where the family did actually have some assets. Mm-hmm. Um, they had assets around other places in the world, too. Sorry, but South Africa? In South Africa. Oh, okay. um, until at least the year 2000, or possibly later. Um, yeah, he's... So he's been declared dead in absentia at this point now, obviously. Right. Um, but there's some that claim his family, like you said a minute ago, too. The kids might mm-hmm. actually know his whereabouts. Um, and possibly have in the past actually visited him. So the eldest son, I can't actually remember the name of the eldest son. There's reports that he literally flew out to to South Africa in this wherever remote, I don't know, there's no details on where mm. exactly in South Africa, but that he wouldn't ever actually have physical contact with his father again, but basically be brought to a place where they could acknowledge <laughs> that he was still alive. That's interesting. 
I, I, and if you believe that story, obviously the son doesn't believe he tried to kill the mother. Either that or they all hated her. Yeah. And that's the reason why he spent every night at the Claremont Club, because she was certifiably it's nuts. It's the classic, right? The, the husband going out to play six six hours of golf just to get some... Uh, <laughs> Some space. I mean, it's not. I, Gain your. Uh, I don't want to sound like I'm just siding with the guy who potentially is a murderer, but I. I the the photos of lot. her are very strange. It looks like she's has no soul. I'm just there's a that. lot of inconsistencies in her story. There's a lot of strange behaviors before and after the fact of all of this happening in years where she basically yeah, like we said, she cut out her kids entirely. She cut out the whole family. Was she just so haunted by this relationship and this? past that she just couldn't even face it that to me i don't even know i feel like there's a lot more going on there and it just is the classic case of a super corrupted opulent rich wealthy family that has the means right like lord lucan out of anyone else that would be in this situation he would have the means to escape and get out of the country when he needed to and to maintain um his his way of life and it's very interesting too because um he, this whole gambling aspect is very crucial too, because he could have squirreled away quite a bit of money, right? Like that she didn't know about and then squirreled it away and kept it in a safe place so that when he does make it, when he vanishes, that's, he could just use that to live off of essentially yeah. and doesn't have to rely on any of the actual um, legitimate titles and, uh, and trust funds and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. But I just, I love this story. It's not what we typically cover on the podcast. There's not really a paranormal element to it. There is history, and we love history, so that's why we're covering it. Definitely. And it's it's legit, man. He is the most notorious missing person that you will never find. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we still might. Who knows? Maybe we'll find his body somewhere or something like I that, wonder. right? I think I should just end it off by saying that Lady Lucan um, just recently passed away, mm-hmm. and she lived out her remaining days, like we said, no, no contact with the family, um, but she passed away in the same house, same bed um, that was the guest home that uh, Lord Lucan was living in the entire time that they were separated, oh, weird. which is just a sort of bizarre thing. She has this morbid, weird connection. It, why would you want... Why, why wouldn't you sell that and live in a condo or something? Like, she's strange. Why? Why? You she's hated this man. She's hanging on to it. Hanging on to it. That's weird. There's there's ghosts in her closet. There's, there's lots of skeletons, there. I think. Definitely. She kind of reminds me, actually, of um, the character of the sister in Taboo. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Just that weird sort of layer of darkness. Yeah. Anyways, uh, well, that's just... That's the mystery. That's the mini zone for yeah. this month. And yeah. we hope you guys enjoyed it. Get get at us with your own personal theories. What do you think? Who's who? Who done it? Yeah, Lady Lucan, Lord yeah. Lucan, uh, another third party potentially. Who knows? Maybe it was the kitten. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it's got its throat. <laughs> yeah, no, we definitely want to hear from you guys. So you can post on the. Uh, I think there's like we can have a little chat going on on Patreon too. But wherever yeah. you guys want to get at us, um, you guys know where to find us and know how to get at us. So yeah, we hope you enjoyed this, and uh, we will have another one coming at you uh, next month. Mm-hmm. Stay tuned. <laughs>